Good afternoon. Sorry, everyone. I was uh, still reflecting on that last keynote. Um, we're going to be talking for a little while here. Uh, our topic is racial justice beyond Trump. We brought together three amazing uh, women. I did talk a lot about men in my keynote because I knew I had three amazing sisters coming at you with this panel uh, to give some kind of balance. Um, so we're going to be talking about racial justice beyond Trump. Where is the nation uh, headed following four years of the Trump presidency? Where is the agenda uh, right now? And we're talking with Grace Martinez of United We Dream, Latasha Brown of Black Voters Matter, uh, Mutali and Conde, AI for the People, uh, all three thought leaders really at the front line of some of the major struggles of our time. So we're going to just jump right in. Um, I, I guess first I should go to Grace, who has the most recent uh, groundbreaking news uh, with this recent federal judge with an announcement about DACA. Grace, tell us what's up with that. What should we expect coming next? Uh, hi, Bakari. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Grace Martinez Rosas. I'm a documented, unafraid, queer, and unashamed. Um, and as Bakari was sharing, I um, have the honor to lead United We Dream. We are the nation's largest immigrant youth-led network in the country that fight for justice for undocumented people in the U.S. And just last night, uh, a district court judge in New York ruled in favor of DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, which is this program that protects me and close to 1 million other undocumented young people from deportation. It allows me the ability to um, work in this country that I have called my home um, and allows me the ability to, to be with all of you today. And I, I wanna, this is a celebration for us all because for the last four years, we have withstood attacks from the Trump administration. He vowed to kill the DACA program on day one. And it is because of a black led cross movement um, space that we're in that we have been able to uh, defend the program. Um, and so I, you know, I feel um, I'm excited to be able to dig in. I'm honored to be on this panel with this group of like tremendous women. But I know deep in my bones that um, immigration justice um, and the defense of DACA is just the floor. That we know the immigrant justice and the fact that there are 11 million undocumented people in this country and many more refugees coming to our shores. It is a racial justice issue. And that until we uh, tackle anti-Blackness, until we're able to see our movements interconnected, we will not be able to solve the issue. And so I'm excited about the work that we're doing um, together and to be able to dig in. Grace, can you tell us what you feel is the net? You say that you say that DACA is the floor and, and not the ceiling. What should folks who want to support your work and your movement, where we should we where should we be focusing our attention? We should be um, defunding the police. We should be uh, ensuring that black women continue to lead in grassroots efforts. We should be uh, investing in grassroots organizing and young people. Um, and part of the long-term vision that we see uh, here at United We Dream is a movement that is able to realize um, that the reason why there are 11 million people, most of us are people of color. Um, there is a, a black immigrants, black undocumented immigrants in the US. The reason why there hasn't been a solution in the last 20 years of a bipartisan inability to pass protection for people is that there are people that benefit from the work and the backbreaking work of black and brown undocumented folks. There are people that profit from that work. And it is until we're able to understand the connections between racial justice, economic justice, and migrant justice, uh, we will we will be able to like uh, solve that and be able to ensure that people are, are moving forward. Ultimately though, in this moment, as we are celebrating that, um, our, our, movement really delivered and protected and defended our democracy this November when mm. Black women, Latinos, young people showed out to vote in record-breaking numbers and like ousted Donald Trump from the White House. I think it's important for us to like really be clear that the Biden administration has a clear mandate to ensure that undocumented young people are protected permanently from deportation 
that we are abolishing ICE and CBP, which is this agency that is responsible for the deaths of children in detention camps. It is responsible for the forced sterilization of women, uh, for the for um, the fact that my father was deported 10 years ago and I have not been able to see him since. Um, and part of the vision is that we are allowing ourselves to ensure that people are able to be free to move, free to work where they want to and free to breathe. Um, Grace, uh, one last thing I wanna ask you. Because we got time today. Usually we are, we're really short on time, with, but the but the uh, the Bioneers crew had the vision to limit our panel to three. We usually be having like five, six people up here. So but I, wa <laughs> I want you to go a little bit deeper on something you said, which was you mentioned uh, that there are people who profit from the status quo. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, and, and I, I'm glad that I'm in this panel with all of you. I, I think that, um, you know, there are, I, go, I come to this work um, as the daughter of Liz and Elia Martinez. They um, were undocumented uh, immigrants that came to the U.S. looking for an opportunity, a chance. And I, I remember how hard it was for my dad um, to be able to hold a steady job because he didn't have papers. I remember um, the mistreatment that my mother had as she was cleaning houses uh, because people thought that she didn't have any recourse or didn't have the ability to speak up or demand her wages when they were stolen because she was undocumented. I remember like feeling in my skin um, the 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 like people looking at my family and I as we were less than because we were poor, because we were Mexican, because we were undocumented. And that is not a, it's my story is not singular. It's not special. It is the story of millions of Americans in the US where uh, there is a 1% that is profiting off of working class people. And it means that, um, you know, our laws are now set up so that only only those migrants that have um, access to money are able to migrate without um, feeling like they, uh, without hesitation. Um, I, I know um, that the way that the immigration system was built was built off of um, the original sin of this country, which is slavery. Uh, it is a, another process in which uh, black and brown bodies are put behind bars. Um, but sisters and brothers and siblings, I bring you good tidings from the young people of United We Dream and the immigrant youth-led movement that we have a vision broader than that, that we believe that people have purpose just because they are alive, that immigrants are should be able to move and should be able to stay at home if they should choose. And th that is why we have joined forces with uh, the Sunrise Movement, with the Movement for Black Lives, with many other folks that are like ensuring that we are talking about a broader future that makes place for all of us, that ensures that uh, workers are able to live and work with dignity and be paid fair wages, where we are able to breathe clean air and clean water, where like um, Black folks can walk down the street and know that in their hearts without without hesitation that they'll be able to go back home to their loved ones at the end of the day. And so I think part of when, what we mean when we say that like uh, folks profit off our bodies is that, you know, there is, we in the midst of this global pandemic, we have exposed that though it is clear that undocumented workers that are stocking our grocery stores, that care workers in our domestic workers in our homes, um, that people that are like stocking up um, our grocery stores, they are essential workers, uh, but we are being treated as essential, but disposable at the same time, because there is um, there is no protection for us. This last Congress ensured that the undocumented people were explicitly excluded from any kinds of protection, from COVID testing, from additional support or healthcare access. Um, and I think that that's very telling of a, of a country. And I believe that we can birth a new country. I believe that this country has the opportunities and the movement um, to make sure that we're different. But I think that we have to be really honest about where we are. And that's, that's exactly where we are. That is amazing, Grace. And I know that the other sisters going to chime in on that and other things. I want to <laughs> turn our attention now to Latasha Brown of uh, Black Voters Matter. Uh, Latasha is also based out of Atlanta. And right now, 
uh, Black Voters Matter has had to turn the attention from the national fight to the Georgia flight fight. <laughs> Natasha, tell us what's happening on the ground. Well, you know, this it seems like this is the never ending campaign, right? I That's swear what it does seem like. <laughs> for, for, for four years straight with no stop. Um, <clears throat> but thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I really love this space anyway, because I think that there is a, um, I think that there's a particular power at the nexus of innovation um, and futurism and what social justice um, and how we radically want to reimagine this nation. And so that is often my mantra around how do we radically reimagine um, this nation going forward. And so even as we're thinking about what's happening in Georgia right now, you know, the framing of what happens in Georgia, you know, let me back up while we are at um, this runoff, people are, uh, I've getting a lot of phone calls of people who want to volunteer and they're saying, how are things going? You know, <clears throat> and we're talking about the subject of structural racism. Well, let me just take us back for a minute. The whole, the whole foundation of runoffs in the state of Georgia, the history of that was rooted in structural racism. It was created to give white, <clears throat> the white ruling class an advantage in the elections. There's a severe drop off that happens right after the election cycle. And so it literally was created as a tool out of structural racism as a tool to marginalize um, voters outside of of the super voters, right? And not even just super voters, but also a small that the, the final decision would be made by a small group of people. And most of the time, what you see is you see a lack of resources um, after the runoff elections. Many of the candidates, particularly unless they are an established candidate, don't have a lot of resources to go into the runoff election. So there's a severe drop off. You know, what we're anticipating this year is that it's going to be different. And the reason why we believe that it's going to be different, even just, you know, as we speak, over a million applications for absentee ballots have gone in to the, the Secretary of State's office. That is extraordinary. And I just need people to understand that is extraordinary. And I think part of that is because we have to really recognize what it is going to take to really, really strengthen democracy. We've been looking at, I think we've been looking at elections kind of two ways. One, well, one way really, and I'm saying we have to look at it another way, that we've been looking at elections and particularly, you know, we've been looking at uh, of black voters in this context of participation, but not in the context of power. And so when we're talking about structural racism, we have to really recognize that structural racism has been equally distributed across this country, not just in the Republican Party, um, who wears it like a badge of honor, but also in the Democratic Party. When you start looking at where the key appointments go, when you start to look at policy priorities, when you start to look at you know <clears throat> appointments, you don't see the same kind of um, energy and effort around making sure that those same communities are in, have power as you do when you're talking about participation. And so where does that leave us as we're talking about in Georgia? Well, I just wanna let folks know that in Georgia, we are lock loaded and ready. We are working, we've already back on the ground. There are many organizations. What you saw happen um, in Georgia in, in November was not, um, was not a fluke. It wasn't just about Trump, although Trump certainly um, was was fueled to the fire, but it really resulted in deep organizing for the last for the last decade. And so in addition to that, what you also saw is you saw a, a black led movement and there was a multicultural um, a response, which actually made the difference. But let's talk about that. A lot of the movement was led by black women in particular, but a black led movement that literally a pro-democracy movement actually that have been working the last 10 years to really lay the foundation on and shift the paradigm so that elections are not just about candidates, it's really about people really building power. That's the work Black Voters Matter is doing. And that's the work that many of us have been doing in this state. And so what you saw happen in November is a result of a couple of things. I often say that this whole nation that the South is red really is not reflective of who lives in the South. When you look at the South, when you look at the change in demographics, if you look at the fastest, several of the fastest growing cities in America, Atlanta being one of them, 
you know, um, when you look at the diversity and the demographic shifts, that there's a particular opportunity, right? But we have to be innovative. We have to be proactive. We have to literally make sure that we're putting investment in that as well. And so in Georgia, when we're talking about this upcoming runoff election, I have, I, I have a, um, a, a, my, my kids are here, if y'all can hear them playing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Trenton, remember what we talked about? Thank you. Okay. And I have an open air like loft where they're playing. So I'm sorry, y'all. I would be sitting under the playroom because that's a good idea, right? <laughs> um, so I apologize. But that's where we are. We're okay. there right now. Okay. This is where okay. we are right now, right? Now, Latasha, one of the things that you've been doing for years is fighting for voting rights. And I know you were very close with with uh with the late John Lewis. Um, can you talk about how the Trump uh, presidency has deepened the crisis of, of, of voting rights and, and deepened the fight for voting rights? And where do we go from here? So I'm hoping that we look at, we take this moment, you know, to really be reflective and not just to react to, oh, everything was Trump. Let's be honest. Voting, um, voter suppression didn't start with Trump and it's not going to end with, Trump is not going to end with Trump. And part of what has happened and part of, I can even say my own personal frustration, I have been working on voter suppression to end voter suppression for over 20 years. I share my own story from in 2000, um, a few years ago, it was two, 1998, nine, um, I was a young candidate running for a statewide office in Alabama and literally was victimized by, by voter suppression where the day where the election was fortified, the sheriff found 800 ballots he found five minutes after the race was certified, 800 ballots in the safe that he forgot. They were never counted. Nobody ever did anything about it. I just lost the race. And they, they were from a county that I had carried overwhelmingly. And so the sting of that really helped even sharpen my commitment to why I needed, and that was over 20 years ago, around needed to work on voter suppression and we've continued to see it. You know, the piece that we've got to talk about around how structural racism right, is and how we've got to really shift the paradigm of how we see it. We look at anti-Black racism as that only impacts Black people, right? But I so love my sister, Gracia, because she understands the connection of how anti-Black racism and that what has developed that level of oppression in that has also been harmful to her community. And she sees a connection um, in my struggle as I see a connection in her struggle. The same thing that I think that, that I believe, quite frankly, I think that progressive whites have missed, that fundamentally on some level, what we've seen is we've seen the end, we've seen voter suppression as this thing, and particularly as it re relates to communities of color, and particularly when we've seen it in the South. You know, it's like, okay, that's that's what happens in the South. Okay, that's what happens to Black folks. It's wrong, right? But that's what happens there. You know, the irony is, what's really ironic is that the very place that was ground zero for voter suppression just two years ago, right, is now the very place that literally the trajectory of where democracy will go in the next four years that impacts all of us will be made in this state. That in this state where there were 200,000 voters, we filed a lawsuit on this Wednesday. And I, I, because we're, we're in litigation, I can't talk a lot about it other than say there were 200,000 voters that were dropped from the voting rolls um, in the state of Georgia. Imagine, right, uh, and, and if they have not registered, they won't be able to participate in this election. Imagine how that's happened since 2013. Imagine if those voters, right, were still on the voting rolls and we were able to reach them. And we are in some, and we've been doing work to really be able to get get them re-registered. But it's another added barrier with the work that we are already doing. I'm saying that because I think it's important for us to make to recognize. I'm hoping that we're reflective in this moment that any time, and Dr. Martin Luther King used to say that there's a threat to justice anywhere. There's a threat to justice everywhere. I mean, that sounds, people say it, but people don't really believe it. Right. And so I think that part of what has happened, even with white America, white America has received that in some level, racism always works. Like it, that works in, on some level, that racism, while it's wrong and it's not the moral thing to do, mm -hmm. right, that not really having a deep understanding of how racism has actually impacted their lives. 
how that racism has undermined democracy in this country, that the reason why this country, the wealthiest country in the world, the country that has been on the edge of innovation and creativity, had, when we're looking at the healthcare system, that our healthcare system, right, we have a weakened healthcare system that could be far, far stronger than it is, right, that on some level structural racism has had a part to play in that, which impacts all of us, that we're look, when we're looking at the criminal justice system, that we recognize that all of us are impacted when we don't have a solid criminal justice system, when the Department of Justice can basically become the, the, law, the, the president's personal law firm, right, that, when, that whenever there is a threat to justice, or a threat to democracy for some of us, it makes all of us vulnerable. So I'm hoping that in this moment, we recognize that even voter suppression and that when we and we recognize that racism, that because we're all connected, right? And COVID-19 is actually, I'm hoping, has taught us that because we are all interconnected as human beings, that those of us that want to advance democracy in this country, you cannot do that if you are literally not dealing with ground zero and where it unravels first. Yeah, Latasha, this is amazing. You know, um, I did a conversation with Angela Woodson at the City Club in which she was talking about what was happening on the ground. Mutale was a part of it. Um, what was happening on the ground here in Cleveland leading up to the election. One of the things she talked about was an elderly black woman who was standing on a long line uh, waiting to vote, uh, early vote. And she talked about how she, how she stood online and how she fought in the 60s and how this was nothing. Mm. These people weren't going to stop her from voting. <laughs> now, you've been around the country on a bus tour. Um, can you tell us some of the stories that you've seen that kind of stand out in your mind first? And then secondly, um, and then we're going to move over to Mutale. If you can, talk a little. You had a vision that you've been writing about called a U.S. Department of Democracy. So we don't have to keep fighting these same fights over and over again every election year. Can you talk about both of those things? Okay, so I'll be really quickly with the bus tour. We have the blackest bus in America and our <laughs> bus is inclusive and it's fun and it's full of love and power. And so what we, um, what we wanted to do is literally a lot of times when you're organizing in the space around politics, you know, it is this, it, uh, many people have used this, this fear element. Like you have to be fearful. If you don't vote, this is what's going to happen. If you don't participate, this is what is going to happen. We wanted to start from a different framework to say you have power. Not that someone has to be elected to give you power. You have power. And how can you use your agency? How can we use our collective power to literally radically reimagine this country and to literally put people in place that align with us so that we can have the kind of changes that we all deserve? And so we have been taking our bus all around the country, including Cleveland, Ohio, um, which is interesting. Um, we had an interesting experience, experience there, and we're actually taking the bus. We're back on the road again. We um, we start back off actually tomorrow. We're doing oh, wow. tomorrow for the U.S. Senate race. There, there's a debate um, between Loeffler and and Walt Warnock, and so we're doing debate watch parties all around. Um, all around our areas are in about seven or eight different counties because Monday is the last day for voter registration. So it's our last big push around voter registration. So we're doing dinner and debate and it's driving. It's a drive-in. You're bringing your cars. Oh, um, right. you come. So anyway, so we're doing that. And a lot of times when whenever you see the bus, the bus is not just popping up. Right. Anytime you see the, the bus pulls up, that means work has already been happening there. Like we're mm -hmm. not just parachuting coming into communities. Those communities we've already been working with. We've been establishing relationships. And then we're coming in as reinforcement. I call us like the we're the political special ops. We're coming mm -hmm. to, like, to really be able to support some of the work that they're doing. And so this last election cycle, we were able to travel to 15 states. Um, on our bus, we were able to support and give resources, direct resources, anywhere from $5,000 to $330,000 to over 600 Black-led grassroots groups. We were able to um, serve as a coordination and we're able to put technology in the hands of those groups with training, being able to have access to tech. Um, to text messaging and and doing phone banks and text banks. I mean, also have data, right? And to also do strategy together. So that's a lot of work on the bus. Um, and I'll just say quickly around, I'll just be real quick around the Department of Democracy. Part of the reason why I think voter suppression continues to happen is because no one is actually ever held accountable and nobody really holds it. Right, you know, because when the Department of Justice is not functioning, you can forget it. We've we experienced that this last these last four years, right? And so 
what happens when the Supreme Court becomes politicized. And, and it, it's, it reminds me of a, 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 what I want is I want there to be the development of a, uh, a Department of Democracy in the same way there was a development 11 days after um, 9-1-1. The Department of Homeland Security was created. It's the first mm -hmm. time we've seen any major reorganization um, of the government in 50 and a half of a century, right? In addition to that, part of the reason, the rationale for creating the Department of Homeland Security is because it was over 100 different agencies that were responsible necessarily, that had different elements and activities around security. Now, there's a whole Department of Defense. There are four branches um, of the military that their sole purpose is to defend the people and the interest and the land of the United States. Yet, we were able to create, I'm, I'm raising this for a reason. We yet this this government created the Department of Homeland Security because it needed it felt like it needed a unifying kind of force to really be able to better coordination and to really focus on and strengthen the security at home on, on in the homeland. The same thing applies, in my opinion, should apply to when we're talking about democracy. Where who holds democracy, right? It is almost so fluid and so embedded, you know, that where people say it's embedded that there is we we we're not honest about you know where democracy, whose responsibility is it, and it is being a key focus in this country. I mean, we are in a, an election cycle where we saw people rallying outside, and we saw politicians and folks like Trump saying don't count votes that's the most anti-democratic thing you can say there were also we noticed that there were republicans that refused to say democracy they would say the, this republic they would not say uh, america as a democracy i'm raising this because i have a fear that if we're not literally embedding and create a vehicle that says the as the constitution lays out that says that unless we have a department to de focus on the, the defense of democracy in this country, I think what we're gonna to continue to see is the unraveling. I don't think that the Trump is the last of it. Mm -hmm. I think you will see it more sophisticated. I think it will be more pervasive. I think it will continue. So I do believe that we need to respond to it the same way was there, there was this response after 911 and recognizing that there was not strong enough that there needed to be more coordination. We need to have that same kind of protection around democracy in this country so that we can hold folks accountable and we can strengthen this democracy so that it's not just aspirational, but that in fact it becomes achievable. All right. That is amazing. We really heating it up now. Y'all should start getting y'all questions ready because uh, we're going to be coming to you in about 15 minutes um, talking to the audience now. So um, Mutale and Kandi, we want to get you involved in the conversation. Please tell us what's happening with your work around the intersection of technology, racial justice, disinformation, and you used a new term with me this time we were prepping, which is technolo techno technological futures. Techn Tell us what's, yeah, so, <laughs> Tell us what's um, happening. Hi everybody. Thank you for inviting me and it's great to be on a panel uh, with my great sisters. So basically what we've been doing at AI for the People is really looking at those moments uh, at the intersection of technology and racial justice. So in this last election year, the question that we posed ourselves were, black people are the most impacted by dis and misinformation. That is the telling of stories that have a kernel of truth, but such an insidious and toxic lie that it can unravel everything around that. Yet when we look at the field of political disinformation, we weren't seeing black thought leaders. We weren't seeing black technologists like me. We weren't seeing black analysts and we weren't seeing black interventions. So what we did this last election cycle is that we followed domestic um, organic campaigns that were targeting specifically black voters. And we found one in particular best practices in this field is that we don't repeat too much because we don't want to amplify them. And we found a, a hashtag which was vote down ballot. And what Vote Down Ballot was attempting to do was to tell Black voters that they should not vote at, at the presidential level unless they were given, uh, unless, they, unless the, the parties met certain demands. And we found that to be a threat because this particular campaign, we're getting much airtime on CNN, but specifically 
on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, they were really gaining a lot of steam. So we looked at a data set of about 3.5 million tweets where we identified this hashtag and we decided to create a counter. So really feeding off the energy of uh, Black Voters Matter, but most specifically in an ongoing conversation with the New Georgia Project, which is led by my, my dear friend, um, and say in foot, not knowing that Georgia would become the center um, of the world very soon after, we started to think about what, what communications tool, given this 3.5 million data set that we had, we could see that black voters were being targeted. What could we do to unravel this? And what could we do to prove that within the black community, it's not just that you need the technology for um, analyzing the field and getting text out. We also need the expectations to do the analytics and then counter defense, right? So we really held that space and we were able to create an alternative um, domestic um, campaign called uh, Vote Down COVID. We released it the week, the week before the election. We targeted using geolocation data to Philadelphia. That was kind of, if we can get people to, to you know, take notice of this there, we can take it national. And we were successful. So in the week before the election, we ended up getting um, 8.5 million impressions across social media. Questlove mm. got involved. Um, Megan Fairchild, who we didn't expect to get involved, a bunch of celebrities were retweeting us and the vote down COVID hashtag ended up getting 2.5 million impressions. So we were able to prove that when you have black people leading technology and when they know how to communicate with their own messages, because much of the disinformation intervention coming from the white liberal left was very much uh, doom and gloom, whereas our messages were joyful. There were videos of black folks talking about COVID, not just what happened to them, but how they were going to overcome it and how the vote really represented this idea that we could get exactly what Latasha was saying, get people in office which align with our belief in science. And at that moment, that was uh, Joe Biden. And we were more sophisticated than just vote for Joe and Kamala. We actually acknowledged this may not be the ticket that you dreamed of. These may not be the people that you want. But in our messaging, we start to we start to encourage people to move from candidates and move towards power. That as much as we have analog lives, that we have digital lives and our digital lives impact the analog. And we now have a, a working model that we can really roll out with other uh, Black movement leaders. So really, in this term of uh, technical futurism, really looking forward into that data set, it's now grown to 3.5 million tweets, but we're going to go off other platforms. And we were able to identify the point at which I was, was first reached out to and the messages that ICE got in that moment. And uh, we want to do some of that um, really deep te digital ethnographic work to figure out what messages were sent to Cube and other black men. Because when we were looking at exit polling, black men, black male support for Trump grew by 6%. And we don't, you know, we're digital ethnographers, so we don't understand that. But if we can start to understand it, we can build these models that we can then share with folks like uh, Black Voters Matter as they're on the ground, say, look, this is what's happening on social. This is the way that we can intervene. The, what you're saying to people in the physical, we can make sure is reflected in the digital because we don't have the policies that we need to, to moderate that content, right? One of the things that we say AI for the people is that policy is the delivery system for ideology. And it, when we look at our digital policies, there is nothing that grounds racial justice and the protection of black people online or in the digital that exists. Mm -hmm. So even again, going forward, uh, you know, we're putting ideas in with the transition team. We've been blessed to being reached out to. Prior to this particular project, I had done AI policy work where I had looked at algorithmic accountability in the criminal justice system, algorithmic accountability in social service determinations. Clearly, I am coming at you from home. So my dear, beautiful son, 
<laughs> in the background. Oh. <laughs> and you will probably hear my baby. Um, my dear, beautiful son is in the background getting snacks. Um, but that's a mommy at home in the digital. But then really looking that how can we then create these policies that are not just protecting the vote because AI for the people, we do work on enfranchisement, we do work on democracy, but we really work on power. So going back to my dear, dear sister and who I'm so proud of, Gracer as well, going forward, what we're actually looking at is this question of defunding the police. And here in New York, what, how are police forces technically, uh, technically empowered? And uh, how is that used against in, in case studies like immigration, but anything as ordinary as walking down the street, right? How are they empowered in a way that criminalizes black bodies? So our next work is really, uh, we're teaming up with Amnesty um, International, Bakari is actually a, a, a partner on that project as well, and really looking at ways that we can divest from these systems of technical oppression and technical racism, as well as advocating for the protection of black folks online whether it's your whether it's how you get to the polls and how you get to vote or in the case of biometrics which i was describing you walking down the street you being tracked for for immigration or others and the very last thing i'll say is we're really interested in case law because we think that the politicians won't move quickly enough. But um, my colleague and say who I'd be, who had referenced earlier from the New Georgia project was really telling us how the voter registration algorithm works in Georgia. And what it does is when it's deciding who to take off the polls, it will look for violations, for example, a federal crime. And if a name like Mike Brown, because of the history of, of the enslavement of black people, there are many black browns. They were not browns when they were in Africa, but when they became chattel, they became browns. And if there's one Mike Brown in a data set that has a fe felony, then they scrape the whole list. So if there are 15,000 other Mike Browns in a state, that algorithm cannot read that this is a Mike Brown that should be taken off the list and this is a Mike Brown that should stay. So we're also really excited about case law around uh, systems like the one that I've just described because they are always gonna hit black and brown bodies the most. And to the point that both my co-panelists have made, AI for the people is for the people, we focus on black lives online. We focus on black digital lives. And our goal is really to create what we call a just technological future. But we are in solidarity with our Latinx brothers and sisters, our trans brothers and sisters, our native brothers and sisters. And we also point out that this is a white problem too. We saw the manipulation of online votes in 2016 and the suppression, the online suppression through Cambridge Analytica, which delivered us a Trump. And for those of us that sit on the left, black, black, white, Asian, Latinx, we all had to live with that. So certainly my work is making sure that in all the movements that take place, that we're looking at the digital, that we're looking at the technical, and that you do have racial justice uh, workers like myself, who are there to really let you know how your systems are being co are being sabotaged from a digital mm -hmm. perspective, and then counteracting. Okay, Mutale, we have a little bit of time for one more. We hope that folks are getting their uh, questions ready and typing those questions into the chat. Um, you know, Mutale, as I'm listening to you talking and I'm thinking about the issue of how this Trump presidency has really negatively impacted racial justice, uh, I'm thinking about those areas in which we might get traction uh, or that we might be seeing some traction that we can see a, ch a change, real concrete changes in the lives of everyday people. When I think about the ways in which people in the community uh, feel so oppressed every day, one of the biggest issues that folks come back to is uh, definitely jobs, mm -hmm. but also this question of police brutality um, and the ways in which these officers continue to basically get away with murder. Can you talk more about how your work intersects with uh, policing and really holding these officers uh, accountable? And what can folks and the Bioneers community do to help 
uh, help you guys in your work? Yeah, so um, our next project is looking, is following New York City through their reimagining, uh, redefining public safety campaign, which looks at not just the NYPD, but we're also looking at ICE and we're also looking um, at the fe federal system, the F FBI, and how they use biometric technology. So um, our focal point is facial recognition. And facial recognition has two vital issues. Number one, it misidentifies black and brown folks 40% of the time. But number two, it was the primary way that protesters were, um, were, were really targeted after the uh, George Floyd uprisings in this city and across the country, as well as one of the primary tools that is used in deportations, which in a city like New York is a huge concern. So what we're doing, we're doing a number of different things. We're producing a movie with uh, Michelle Stevenson um, and Joe Brewster, which which we are shooting just the, the trailer right now, and we'll go into production next year. We're doing mass political education, so uh, rap sessions. Uh, we have other partners that we haven't signed, but big national partners are coming on as well as Amnesty International. And we're working with the city of the public advocate here in New York. And what we really want to do is let people know when we redefine this idea of public safety, when we redefine this idea of the police, we cannot also have these forces where much of this billions of dollars are going into these surveillance and tracking technologies. And they're creating this power asymmetry where black and brown people um, are being targeted in a way that they cannot fight back. So. Mm -hmm. In terms of empowering the everyday people, certainly using art and entertainment. Uh, Monday, I have uh, I have what I call my big celebrity calls as I talk to them about not just defunding the police, but redefining public safety and reimagining what it means to be secure, right? We're often told these technologies are for security. Security is in community. Security is in love, security is in mm -hmm. compassion. It is not in tracking of vulnerable groups, but then even beyond that, having this very clear advocacy ask and this very clear policy ask, because as I've said previously, if ideology is gonna move through policy, we need anti-racist technical policy in the state because we've already seen bans in San Francisco. We Massachusetts looks like it's gonna be the first uh, state to ban, but what would it be like to ban that in New York? And then obviously these other discussions we're having with the Biden folks also saying that in biometrics, you ban facial recognition in uh, body cam. And that was, they took statute that I had been responsible for uh, leading the drafting on uh, while I did some congressional work in the 116th Congress, they were able to take that language and put it into the Justice of Policing Act. We have the in a, we have inalienable inalienable rights to privacy, freedom of speech, and freedom of assembly. But we are not going to be able to exercise them unless we regulate. In terms of what can the Bioneer community do? This is a community of artists. This is a community of innovators. This is a community that have loud voices. Join our campaign. It is called Ban the Scan. We are um, launching through Amnesty International on January 18th, we believe. We're still we're still thinking of we're still thinking about that. You can go online, you can issue FOIL requests to your local governments because we want the records from the DOJ, we want the records from police forces, as well as philanthropic um, activities. And then also come out and support our film come out to our political education uh, summits. We're really much targeting black communities and we want to make that connection between folks like from United We Dream, right? To say you are fighting for immigration and we are fighting to dismantle the tools from which that immigration can, can even take place, as well as Black Voters Matter, right? Where the same people that were that are being energized to come out and fight, not only is there this, this dis and misinformation threat in the context of elections, but if you're trying to get a job, you're probably gonna be algorithmically scanned. If you're doing anything in your life, this is an issue for you. Can we make this a larger 
issue and realize that technical justice is racial justice. Mm -hmm. And the underpinnings of that is actually economic justice too, because we're also not creating these technologies or the companies nor drawing the wealth from them. But that is, I could speak about this all day. I'm, I'm writing a book right now called <laughs> okay. Automated Anti-Blackness. So I could speak about this all day and I'm really interested to open up. Okay, we've got questions coming in. You guys are doing great. We're really hitting a lot of points and covering a lot of territory. The first question that I have is uh, the majority of sympathies in this country lie with the Democratic Party platforms, but however, the Democrats seem unable uh, seem unable to cogently and coherently communicate them to the public. Do you guys have ideas as to how they can get that going? I mean, it? I think a couple of things. One, in fairness to the, you know, and I'm a cr critic, but in fairness to the Democratic Party, I think it's 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 um, harder when you're being inclusive. I, I mean, I, I think that the Republicans have basically um, decided that <clears throat> that the only people they're going to look out for is rich white folks, right? And they've been very clear about that. And so I think that it makes it more nuanced. And I think the messaging more nuanced when you have when you're representing a, a much a much diverse much more diverse constituency. The, the second thing, though, too, is I also think that there is a a a silent, there's an elephant in the room um, within the Democratic Party that there are there is a establishment part of the party. And there is the base of the party and they're not the same. Right. And so what you see in particularly you see a disproportionate a part of the Democratic leadership come out the white elite. Right. But you see the base of the party are working class, middle class and poor people. And oftentimes what you see is this mixed. I think that there is a misalignment even in values. Right. There's an alignment of, you know, I just most recently, as and I was so glad that Grace brought up the defund the police piece. Right. That there there is even a tension there. Defund the police was fine. Right. As long as folks were using that. Well, even though there were people who had problems with it. The truth of the matter is it actually activated a group of young folks that when you look at there was a rise of young folks that the drop off from 2016 was regained. And part of that, we've got to really give credit to the movement for black lives, really for being able to engage those young folks. Right. And so now we're saying, hold up, hold up. You don't know what you're doing, because what you're saying <laughs> is to piss off this group of, of, of this group of folk. Um, who don't like the phrase. And as long as they do that, the Republicans, they're going to continue to attack us. Right. And at the end of the day, you know, I think it's a, it's, it, it is disingenuous to ask people on the ground who have very little resources to ride or die with you, but you won't ride or die with them. And my point is that there has to be some level of us having a real honest conversation about how structural racism lives within even the framing um, and the political leadership, even in the party, right? And that there is one perspective in the party that we hold that the leadership, that all, we all know this, that immediately when a person is going to get elected in the Democratic Party, the, it doesn't matter who it is, whether it was Clinton, whether it was Obama, whether it was Carter, there's going to be an immediate shift to the right immediate shift to the right. And so part of what has happened though, I think there's a lack of understanding that actually the left, what is considered the left has actually grown. So the center, they're still operating like the center is center right. When I actually think it's center left, but the party has not really adjusted to really be able to make that that kind, I mean, really adjust it to really address that. And so you've got this tension within the party around how do you message, right? What does leadership look like? And is it reflective of the base? And I think that that's the tension. That's what we've got to work through and work out. Okay. We got another question, uh, again, focusing on young people. Uh, and that is, are there specific campaigns to educate young people on the potentials of the government taking their information? How can we all use technology to our advantage to continue highlighting uh, state-sanctioned violence? I guess that's for you, Mutali. Yes, there are campaigns. Uh, AI for the people are certainly part of that. And we use our culture as celebrity uh, to do that. So even in the campaign that I described with Van the Scan, we're doing everything from commissioning uh, photography 
photography exhibits around the world because we're not just looking at the United States in that particular campaign. We're looking at the West Bank. We have a case study in New Delhi. We're also looking in Mongolia and uh, AI for the people. And I'm the global lead on that. We're looking at an artist takeover of Times Square to really engage young people in a way that they can touch, taste and feel. We're asking for folks to look out for CCTV cameras. So when you're walking down the street and you see a camera, we're now educating you to that, the fact that that is part of the technical infrastructure. In terms of taking information, there are great movies out that um, I'm an arts and culture person and a celebrity person. So I'm always looking for, for ways to bring that in. But The Social Network is on Netflix right now. It was the number one movie in the United States over the last couple of weeks that really talks about the attention economy and how social media and other platforms that we're all using every day are also uh, pushing us and nudging us towards making certain decisions, whether it be sales or whether it be political. And I think one of the things I have to really shout out my good brother, Rashad Robinson at Color of Change, who's also done a lot of accountability work around Facebook and and really the mm -hmm. amount of advertising that the advertisers that they carry that also fund far right hate campaigns as well. So it's in one vertical, but they're looking at another. One of the things that I'm hoping AI for the people can do since we are a communications firm is be the storytellers for that, right? So create these pieces of art and create these pieces of culture that enable us to have that conversation. And uh, the campaign that we did with Miss and Disinformation, where we used video, uh, we, we had great partnerships through moveon.org on that particular campaign. But we use video, we use music, we use dance to really drown out this message of hate. Because I think that in order to get young people, you have to get them at the point of, of hope and possibility. Because if I just come out here and tell you everything's wrong, that's so disempowering. But Latasha did a great job, and we definitely agree at AFP. You start out by saying, this is what's happening, and we have the power to change it. And since we're looking at Black and brown people, we're going to change it through culture, and we're going to change it through joy. Okay. We've got questions coming in like crazy right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one of the questions is, can you talk more about the intersectionality of racial justice, social justice, and environmental justice. Uh, mm -hmm. Who wants it? I can go. Um, I, I think one thing I'll share is that the reason why I am honored to be um, part of United We Dream um, is that I. It, this panel is actually an example of that. The people most directly impacted are often and always at the center of innovations, breakthroughs, and solutions that we all need. And so when we think about intersectionality as Audre Lorde taught us, we do not live single issued lives. Um, I don't get to decide at what point I am queer and at what point I am undocumented and at what point I'm a woman. I am all of those things all at the same time. So when we think about environmental justice, when we think about racial justice, migrant justice, um, economic justice, I think that like, part of the solution of being able to have breakthroughs is ensuring that people that are the most directly impacted are leading in the space that are able to embody the connections of that and not just talk about it. I think the second thing is that it's ensuring that we are investing in young people because young people across the globe and in the US and in our cities have been at the cutting edge of the largest social movements in this country. I am honored to lead the immigrant youth justice movement um, and work side by side with um, with other folks across the country that are like doing the work of young people. And like, we are creating the conditions for the impossible to be possible. And so when we think about, we're thinking about that when it comes to policy, um, we worked um, together with uh, the Sunrise Movement, March for Our Lives, uh, Dream Defenders and many, many other young people um, to, together to be able to articulate um, that we, uh, that we're able to move together what a policy vision will look like that brings together racial justice, migrant justice, and um, environmental justice. We also believe that it's important for there to be uh, a cultural and a celebration of like the fact that we are that we live this intersectional lives. And so I think it's going to require us to 
think about and birth together a new movement that does not put me and the members of United We Dream and like, these are the immigrants right here. Um, okay. And it puts like uh, the folks that, uh, that are doing uh, grassroots organizing, um, oh, like this is where the criminal justice folks go. I think that together we are birthing a new movement that has stood up to Trump has not only survived, but thrived in the last four minutes and that four years and that really understands that just because we got rid of Trump in this election does not make the 70 million US citizens that voted to reelect him after seeing um, the way that he stood by the side of um, white nationalists, the way that he was responsible for the separation of children uh, from their families that they still wanted him again. And so it is um, up to us to birth a new America, that a new movement that is really looking at our work in an intersectional lens that rejects uh, when people and we ourselves put ourselves into these uh, really hard frameworks. And that is looking to ensuring that we're delivering um, a real policy, political and cultural change for our folks. Man, that's so powerful. That 70 million number is something though, ain't it? Okay, y'all, we're getting a lot of activity around the defund the police uh, phraseology. And uh, here's one of them. Uh, can, we, can you guys give us suggestions on how we talk about the uh, policing idea? I'm sorry, how we talk about the policy idea to fund the police? How can it be better in, articulated as a comprehensive policy? That's one question. Somebody else said, Obama said it's too radical. What strategies do we have uh, to get people to begin to talk about it and understand what's meant by defund the police? Um, Any of you guys <laughs> want to jump on that? I can uh, start. Latasha, I want to hear no, you. I'll be, I'll be very short. Uh, the way we're getting around it in New York is that we're talking about redefining public safety. And we're doing that with, we launch in January, we're doing that with organizers and activists, and we are co-creating this idea of reimagining and foregrounding that. But I also think that we should be very clear that we're also looking at resource uh, we're looking at the way the NYPD are resourced. So if we were to take $3 billion out of the NYU budget today, that would actually take them to their 2015 level. 2015. And we still had a police force and they were still working. So in redefining public safety, we're thinking about how can these resources be reinvested in communities. How can we, to, to pick up Latasha's idea, and then I'm gonna go back, because I really wanna hear from her. Can you imagine if we had automatic registration in the state and some of that money went there or community school or mental health um, ideas? We've just spent a year in Philadelphia around trying to build capacity uh, for that particular group of organizers to understand dis and misinformation. A week before the election, Walter Wallace Jr., who isn't trending on Twitter and who isn't a hashtag that we're organizing around, was shot by the police during a mental health break. My heart breaks. Can you imagine if they had been able to call people that could have given him the help that he needed rather than police that shot him 10 times? So we're thinking about through community and through saying what we want to do, we want to reimagine and recreate. That would be our way to get around. And then I'll yield back because I would love to hear. Okay. From um, Latasha, it's so, coming at you lot, now. There's a lot of questions. So I'm, I'm not going to, I'll be really, really, I'll try to be really um, brief on this. You know, okay. I went to the Olympics a few years ago in England when the last time the, um, the Olympics were in London and there was this drunk belligerent man who the police came and, and, and they were dealing with and my heart was beating the whole time because I was waiting until, because he was belligerent, right? I was waiting until they got aggressive with him and, they, and he didn't, they didn't. And then so he had launched and so I was afraid that they were going to shoot him and then I discovered and I looked and I, they didn't have any guns. And so the guy next to me, I said to him, I was like, Oh, they, where, where are their guns? And he said, oh, no, the police here, they don't carry guns. I, it had never even crossed my imagination. And my definition of a police officer was a person who has the right to carry a gun and shoot people if you're doing wrong, right? I'm raising that because I do think that defund the police, while it is making 
Um, many people are uncomfortable. We don't, I mean, that's not an argument, right? You know, it's the same way that I see as a trigger. The, the question is, is it working? Because let me right. say this, <laughs> yeah. people are talking about defunding the police, right? They didn't use, they use the nice term. Folks have been talking about the allocation of resources around defense and the police department for for, for the last two decades. Right. It got no traction. People right. have said it's nice, they fixed it up, they put it in a box and a ribbon on it. There's no discussion, but defund the police trigger. It mm -hmm. triggered us all, right? Mm -hmm. And out of that trigger, it what the trigger does is it points to what is it you're not willing to be with. And I think that it's making us, it's forcing us to reimagine what law enforcement should look like in this country. Do we, we should be, we should ask the question, do we need a police force? And if so, why, right? We should be asking the question, what are other ways that we need to look at resources? We should be asking the question of how can we get around this? The question itself, the questions mm -hmm. that you're getting and including the question that you just asked, asked me, Bakari, to me yes. is evidence that defund yes. the police in fact works. Yeah, this is a great, it's a great uh, question. And I love your response, Natasha. One of the things I would say to people who have a problem with that is really think about how much we want young people to be civically engaged. And then the fact that when they become civically engaged, then we say to them, well, you're doing it the wrong way. But well, don't say that. Well, we need young people to be engaged to bring forth new ideas. And I think we should continue to encourage young people because they are thinking about things that we haven't thought about. They are living in this society and coming into society at a different time. And things are different like social media and other things. And they may be right about some of the things that they're asking us to consider. And that's how the country changes and move forward. To that end, well, next question. Let's, let's yes. In San Francisco, they made a decision of reallocation of $120 million. Tell me anybody who has had a phrase about pre reorganizing and prioritizing in the last 20 years that's had that level of success. My point is, I'm not saying it's the end all and be all because right. it doesn't work for everybody. Right. But I do think that we have to acknowledge that their activists are doing what activists are supposed to do. They're supposed to push us. And then we really have to think about how do we take advantage of the opportunity and build what needs to be built. All right. I love it. Now we back back to you, Latasha, with the next question, okay. which is what can individuals do to combat the system of voter suppression? I love they call it a system. What strategies and direct actions work? Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the first thing, let, let me say this. There is, you know, those of us who are voting rights advocates talked about in 2013 when the gutting of the Voting Rights Act. Well, one, let me even go before that. 55 years ago, the Voting Rights Act passed, right? But what we're not acknowledging, you can walk across there. Um, what we're not acknowledging is when the Voting Rights Act um, passed in 55 years ago, it was a compromise. We received the Voting Rights Act as if it was the end all and the be all. It was actually a compromise at the time. It was it was very very progressive given the time that we were in, but it was it did not go far enough even in that moment. And so what we need is we need stronger protections. There's a couple of things I think we need short term and long term. And I don't we don't have that much time. That's a whole nother I think workshop. We got a little bit of time. We got about nine minutes. Okay, we got to you know, I, but but I'm gonna be short because I'm, I'm gonna try to be as short as I can. The first thing is I think that one in the short term, we need to make sure that right now that we're fighting for the rights of folks who their rights have been infringed, which is why we filed a lawsuit this last, on Wednesday, to have the 200,000 people that were dropped from the voting rolls in Georgia to be restored. And so those of us, I mean, I think wherever we are, we have to fight every time we are seeing voter suppression, we have to fight and raise our voices about it. And it doesn't matter if it happens in Georgia or North Dakota or uh, Arizona, we should be reaching out to our Congress folks, our senators and saying, we have to do something about this. One, we need added protections. And the first thing that you can do is pass a, the John Lewis Voter, Registr voter Restoration Act which is the restoring of the Voting Rights Act, but I don't think we stopped there. Secondly, I'm gonna put it out there, and I know folks, I'm, I, I do believe 
We need a Department of Democracy. I think precisely that is why we need another agency, a cabinet level agency, to really be able to look at the protection of those of us as citizens. That in many ways, what we've seen an encroachment over the years, that the political parties have gotten more powerful. The corporate America has gotten more powerful and more influential. Even special interest groups have gotten more, whether they're on the left or the right, have been becoming more powerful. Citizens have actually, in my opinion, within the process now we're almost like a proxy and the process that was designed for us there has to be a mechanism that actually strengthens and set and puts voters of ahead of everybody have more weight in this entire process which is why i think we need not just the voting rights act but we also need something like the department of democracy the third and the final thing that i'll say is um unless unless we can and and we're saying this and there's not enough time to really go into it but this is a space for innovators, for innovative thinkers. We have to think outside the box. We have mm -hmm. to recognize that we can't just stay in, well, what did the founders intend it? Because the founders didn't even intend for me to talk to you today. Matter of fact, the founders <laughs> didn't to call four of us to be talking today. No, that's right. <laughs> that's humanity. So they were severely limited in their vision, right? And so I think of myself as a black futurist. I also think of myself as in that way, literally we have to create more opportunities where innovation is rewarded. I oftentimes as a black person in this work, when I've done this work, I've had to come to this work and show a track record. I've had to show what it is that I've done. I've almost in some ways not had the opportunity to be innovative. I had to stay in, this is what I said I can do. And then um, pledge that I'm gonna give the DNA of my firstborn, right, to prove that I've got um, some credibility to be able to do it. Yet I have seen my white counterparts get thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars to test ideas and to get the grace and space to fail, right? Because part of what we know even in R&D, that is some level that we allow people the space. Oftentimes communities of color are not granted that kind of grace. So giving us the space so that we can be forward thinking, that we can implement new innovative ideas, that we can test new strategies. I think that that is something that this group in particular, being a group of creatives and innovators can do. All right, we will get down. I, we got. I, I okay, would just go add, ahead. We got time. I would just add to that that there is a funding thing here because when we came and said that black people can can do this uh, disinformation analytic work, and we want to work with black organizations, nobody supported us. When we have just done our our feedback and we were able to show a campaign and we were able to show traction and we were able to show that we were a, that we influence this group of voters now they're coming to fund us but ask me if my boys and i ate the whole year that i was doing that r d for myself and we shouldn't have to be poor and we shouldn't have to sacrifice so much because we mm -hmm. believe i believe in black people in the future i believe in brown people in the future and i also believe that we don't even know the questions to ask unless we are brave and unless we mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. We got about uh, seven more minutes. Next question. How do we get groups to work better together across race? Uh, any? You know, I will tell you, I'll give an example in Georgia. I mean, you know what? I think part of structural racism has made us run away from who we are. <laughs> right. And I think that when people have been leaning into it, listen, I am we are on. We say it. Um, I, we have the blackest bus in America, but at any moment in time, you, we should really be called a rainbow coalition, right? <laughs> there is our, the, the, the support of our work is all across the board, right? And I think part of it is because we are standing in the space of authentically who we are and something about when you stand in the space of authentically who you are, it opens up the opportunity for other people to see value in that. And so that model that says everybody has to be the same, that doesn't work. It does not work because people don't have the space to work together. And those force coalitions that all decide that have to have this one model, they are never sustained, right? But when I'm seeing these organizations that are able to come together organically, right, where they're able to come where, where you don't throw a fish in and tell them to divide the fish, but, but you're actually supporting them, that they're able to get resources, they're able to share resources, that there's something about that that I think has literally led to what I, I have seen a remarkable change on that front in Georgia, 
When I first moved to Georgia, it was a very, what I would call it, this nonprofit competitive environment, almost like corporate America. And what I've seen when resources, as these groups have gotten more resources, as they've been able to literally go to some of the, even the same sources that literally I've never seen the kind of coalition, collaborative work um, that I've seen in the last five years in my experience in the state of Georgia. And I think resources, I think resources have been a part of that. I think that how philanthropy would often lift up one and not support like a collective or decide what the priority is. Instead of communities deciding what their priorities, I think that that undermines people working together unified. All right. Yeah, I will just say really quick, okay. Grace, that you go because you haven't. What we found were black organize white organizations that were that just said let black women lead after George Floyd. Nobody was really trying to hear what AI for the people were doing or black technologists or when I would say to them the next field of technology is going to be black, brown, queer and trans and we are going to fix the future because we can mm -hmm. see the future. The minute George Floyd was, died, we ended up uh, being funded and leading, leading. I mean, moveon.org is a massive national organization and we led that work. Um, Grace, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back because I wanna hear you. I, what I'll add here is um, two things. One is that um, it, when we do uh, cross racial, cross movement work together is, um, and when it works is when people are really rooted in um, relationships in understanding that like our, although our destinies and our futures are intertwined, our lives are, and the issues that we face are different. Um, and when we have respect for that and when we understand each other in that way, I think that that's when we thrive. And then the second one is that you have to be able to find people that have a similar discipline of hope. Because if we are, as we move forward in this moment, there is a structure, we've talked about structural racism, we've talked about how there are systems that are um, in place that would benefit from the pain of black and brown people. But unless it is, the work is grounded in mutual joy, unless it's grounded in, in the ability to be able to to look beyond um, the mess that is around you and look to be able to born a new tomorrow for not only for yourself, but for the generation of people to come. That is when I have seen, I've witnessed um, in the front line, which is the connection with United We Dream Action, the Movement for Black Lives, the Working Families Party. That is when we do work and when we shift to the country and when we really re rewrite history. So I'm excited to be able to continue to astonish the world with these beautiful women on the panel, with you, Bakari, and with everyone here in the Bioneers uh, team. Wow, uh, Grace, uh, that was so powerful. Did you say, did you say discipline of hope? Is that what you said? Discipline of hope. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, y'all. Right, so that's good. Really great. <laughs> <laughs> really we have two minutes left. If you all, somebody is sitting on a burning question, we here for you. Send that question into the chat. Now, before, while we're waiting in the meantime, it, it, hopefully we'll get one more. Some of the folks are asking you all to name books and campaigns for people to check out. Uh, anybody want to go first? Should I throw let's some out Grace. there? Talk to me. I said, let's start with Grace since she still got a hot mic. And <laughs> <laughs> well, so well, I'll say, campaigns, I'll et cetera. Say. I'll say to check out Bakari's book because I know that he has one out, um, and so we'll sure we'll be sure. I know that um, there's the women on this panel are also writing some more. I'll, I'll say the United We Dream has launched our undeniable campaign because we believe that such as our pain is undeniable, our demands and our power is also undeniable. And so I think that that's uh, one that I'll share with folks. And honestly, like I think that it's going to be important for us to continue to collectively keep our eyes on Georgia, but ensuring that we're not, uh, that we are making a long-term commitment to the Black women-led grassroots organizing in that space, and that no matter the outcome of that election, that we are able to leave with it with a lot of pride, with a lot of clarity about what it means for the future. So that's, those are the two places that I would point people to. Well, right. the first thing I did right was the day I started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on. Listen to some music, y'all. Get, get a little joy. Like, that's literally how we're going to change and transform. We that's literally right. love each other and literally stand on this principle of the love of humanity. All right. And we're at the end of our time. 
You guys were amazing. Thank you so much, Bioneers, for having us. We love y'all. Peace. Bye.